Hello and welcome to another bout of unboxing. Today, my sparring partner is Nick Telson. Nick is the founder of Design My Night, one of the UK's fastest growing nightlife websites ever, um, which he's now exited. Nick, um, more recently, is the founder of Horseplay Ventures, um, through which he is invested into a number of early stage tech startups looking to scale. He's also the host of his own podcast called Pitch Deck, um, which apparently now is in the top three of global business podcasts. So a bit of podcasting goals for me there. Uh, and also mentors, uh, mentors a host of entrepreneurs through the Virgin Startup Program as well. So as you can imagine, really looking forward to um, picking Nick's brains on running a tech startup in general. Um, and also chatting to him a little bit about his personal journey and the importance of authenticity and being yourself. So, Nick, without any further ado, um, and that was quite a long intro, that one. I reckon you might have even taken the biscuit. Welcome to uh, The Ring. Yeah, really, really pleased to be here today. Yeah, good stuff. Now, um, yeah, it's, it's you said in the email before it was probably half the reason you came on just was for the unboxing caricature. Is yes. that right? to see that <laughs> and hopefully i can use it separately on other things as well <laughs> yeah no exactly i don't I hope, hope you do but uh, yeah i think that's my major trump card of um of trying to get um uh, you know founders and investors on so definitely be keeping on using that um nick i, I want to sort of dive straight into it really and uh, i like to start off the podcast just by talking about an unboxing is is often about those real initial stages of starting a business and the and the challenges and the pressures that kind of hold you back from taking the leap as it were so if you could sort of just trace back and talk to me about where the kind of entrepreneurial journey or sort of the notion of creating your own path rather than just kind of getting a job where the descriptions already laid out um where did that start for you and where did the first inklings of it come I think I'd always so well from my family. So my dad's uh, always been an entrepreneur um, or he'd call himself a businessman, not an entrepreneur. So he's always done his own businesses. He left school when he was 16 and then started up various companies to be successful. Um, so I've always had that in my life. Um, Mum also um, has her own. Uh, she's a beauty therapist. So she's always done her own. She's always had a room at home. So uh, we always used to have her clients in the house as well. So I've always had that around me. So I don't know if that necessarily made me think at a younger age, that's definitely what I want to do. But I think it just seeds it in your brain that, oh, okay, you can do that. Um, I think, you know, I always wanted to be like a lawyer um, or in marketing or something like that. So from early ages, I didn't necessarily want to be a founder. Um, and then, yeah, did the, did the usual route, um, did languages at university. Um, so nothing around business or marketing or whatever. Um, and then went into L'Oreal. So as big a corporate as, as you can imagine, a world away from startups um, and went on their grad program, um, which was great. Um, L'Oreal is a very exciting company. Um, it's essentially a marketing company as well. Um, you know, that that's what it does best. Um, it's just pushing out great marketing um, programs for, for new products. And I was lucky enough to be there for about four or five years, um, worked my way up to marketing manager of one of the brands. Um, and I think the point for me was then I started looking above me at L'Oreal and it was a general manager, um, in the UK or Paris and actually what they did didn't really interest me um you know you the higher you go in a corporate the less you actually do on the ground and you're just sort of reporting and you know in the in the UK at L'Oreal you're reporting into Paris a lot and just giving them your numbers and presentations which didn't really appeal to me so I think at the back of my head I was like oh okay you know what do I do next to keep the sort of flame going that I loved marketing and creativity um and lucky enough my best friend from uni Andrew um had always wanted to do his own thing so in his mind he always wanted to do his own thing um he went to work for Accenture so probably even more corporate than L'Oreal um and then 
it organically we came up with the idea for design my night we didn't we weren't sat down thinking we have to come up with an idea the idea came to us in conversation and then we thought let's give it a go and didn't really think too much we just started the journey together did it actually come from a a personal problem as the sort of classic entrepreneur story goes was it a personal problem or was it more just it came up it wasn't necessarily a personal problem we were in new york at the time on holiday and um there was a couple of websites there that were around drinks offers and going out in new york um we also spoke to the hotel concierge who was like where do you want to go what music do you want what type of venue do you like and we can't actually remember like who actually thought of the idea but that night we started discussing oh wouldn't it be great to have something like that in London and like, I'm from London born and bred so you know I knew all the website you know there was time out and and back in the day there was one called view London which was very big but they weren't just very good digitally um so that's sort of what got our brains thinking the initial idea for design my night was more on a deals drinks deals um and then the more we spoke to people about that, and I actually had a, a, a good friend of mine works at Diageo, she still does. Um, and she said, oh, Diageo would never advertise on a website like that because we can't promote cheap drinking. And, and back in the day, that was our business model was, well, let's just build a website. It will get big and we'll sell advertising. Um, this yeah. was like 10, 11 years ago. Um, and she actually put us off that idea. And then probably our first bit of cleverness came was we looked at like money supermarket and all of those that were around at that time and we thought oh wouldn't it be great to do like a price comparison site for going out because London can be very expensive you know you could go and buy the same cocktail for five pounds or twenty pounds um so that was that became the first iteration of design my night was the first price comparison site for nightlife um and that's how we sort of got in the drinks deals angle as well you know we're talking about happy hours and promotions but also if you wanted a really nice cocktail you could find that on design my night too so that was like the first iteration the first pivot before we even launched of what design my night was going to become yeah just on that pivoting point how common is or how rare i guess is it that a startup finishes up sort of doing what it initially set set up to do in your experience is it again is it like sort of the myth of does that happen a lot and and actually should you be be open to pivoting yeah i think i think it happens a lot um i think it is a bit glamorized so i don't think it happens as much as people think um i think with pivoting and I think what we found, and we did pivot a lot, and we pivoted to a software company, which was a big pivot. And, and that's what made us in the end. Um, so yeah, we are definitely a story of pivoting. Um, but now as an investor, I think it's more, you know, you can do a wild pivot, but then there's also just pivoting, which can be, do you go after a different customer? or do we need to tweak the product to do this so it doesn't have to necessarily be a huge total strategy pivot which i think a lot of people think but when i meet founders now i think that's one of the biggest things i'm thinking and when i uh, have a chat with them about investment what i'm really looking to see is do they understand the industry that they work in do they really understand what the user or the client wants needs what other software is there in that industry? Because if you totally understand the industry you're working in, you will then be able to pivot if you need. And that's what our investors said to us were they invested before software came around for us. And they were like, we knew Design My Night as we invested wasn't going to be your golden egg. But we just trusted you and Andrew that you really understood the bar industry, which was our focus at the start. And you were very close to customers when you were building Design My Night. And we just knew you were the two characters to be able to build something and understand what the industry would need, which we did eventually land on with the booking system. Like it. So that's a really interesting point in terms of the it's about sort of the person and their unique sort of capabilities to understand a market sort of i feel like this will quite nicely link us on to 
kind of authenticity really because in terms of tips for you know a founder maybe listening and and wanting to be a very investable company and you saying that knowing the industry is important do you think that's something that you can fake or do you think it's not really possible to fake that you can fake it um but good investors will do due diligence so you know for example a, a big one i I see whether I'm being BS or faked is competitors. So, oh, there's no real competitor like us, or oh, there's this, you know, you get the competitor chart and yours has all the ticks and the others have two ticks. Um, you know, any investor worth their salt will go and look at that and will try and speak to customers of the other bits of software. And the minute I see that what I've been fed is either uh, lies or not understanding the market that's a big no-no for me um so you can fake it but i think you'd you'll eventually get found out and were you did you love that industry were you how did you kind of really get to understand the nightlife industry and the different players was that kind of more from like you loved going out and going to different bars or was it more from you just really wanted to make the business grow and you just spent hours doing research. <laughs> yeah, I think everyone thinks we were just out drinking the whole time. Yeah. Um, I mean, I was 25 when I started it, so it was a good age for that. Um, I, I mean, I did like going out. I think that wasn't the driving force of Design My Night. You know, we actually went out hardly ever when we started Design My Night. It's a, it's a, it's a going out killer. Um, I think what we did well was we just spoke to the clients constantly. Um, so when Design My Night was just a listing site, you know, when we would sign up people, we would, wouldn't just sign them up and they would, we would be a faceless company and they would be a faceless client. We really spoke to them you know, would, they would always invite us for a drink at their bar or whatever. And, and, and we would always do that and chat to them and learn the industry. We, we weren't in the hospitality industry. So really understanding what they liked from a listing site point of view and, and, and trying to just get under their skin a bit more. You know, we were always like, oh, you know, what other pain points do you have in the industry? Um, really trying to understand their operations, because I think we knew that a listing site would only get us so far. So we were just very inquisitive. We were very friendly. We, you know, we're, we're friends with a lot of our clients now. Um, and they almost wanted to help us. You know, they liked us and they liked what we were doing with Design My Night. And the idea for the reservation system was from a marketing manager of a bar group. It wasn't Andrew and I's genius idea. She said, you should do a reservation system for bars because we all use restaurant systems and they don't work for us. Um, and it was our big leap as founders. That was one of our big founder decisions then was, okay, do we shift the company to software? So that was our big founder decision. But the idea from that came from a client who's actually a friend of mine now. Got it. Awesome. Now that's, that's really cool to hear. And uh, I just wanted to also get an, an idea of the time scale of, this all going on because it's also very easy to see you know exited founder on linkedin and, and it just kind of oh you know he got lucky or it happened overnight or you know whatever so it'd be interesting to hear sort of you, you mentioned that was 10 11 years ago so just the time scale put into perspective and, and how long was it when you still had your full-time job and you were working on design and night did you sort of take a leap and hope that it would work did you get investment first so if you could just give us a bit of an idea of the time scale and sort of the the leap points that would be very interesting yeah so we, when we came up with the idea and started working on it and had an agency starting build design my life that whole journey was about eight months and we were still at our companies so andrew and i would meet every weekend we'd actually normally go to the accenture office um and sit there and work every saturday creative, hub. creative hub of accenture yeah they just had coffee and printers and so he signed me in as a client every weekend yeah. um not billing me luckily um and then we'd go and meet up on sunday so we'd normally go to starbucks on regent street because i live north london he lives south london um we would meet many nights as well in the week. So it was the classic 
you've got to hustle um and and we were excited it's so exciting in that early stage um so we did that for about eight months while we were building the platform and then we put the platform live um god i think it was december november 20 20 2009 i think um and put it live thought okay let's see what's going to happen with this um got some early very small but early traction people using it um seo was one of our big things so you know we started focusing on seo which again didn't cost us anything in in the grand scheme of things um and it was after about six months of it being live where we thought okay there's something here um i was we were well i I was doing sales so i was getting phone calls at my desk at l'oreal and was like running off into meeting rooms and actually my boss who's uh, a very good friend of mine now pulled me aside and said i know you're up to something um just so you know you know be very careful you know your l'oreal contract says a lot of things that you shouldn't be doing right now so just decide what you want to do um so it was after that chat um i actually left l'oreal and we split andrew's salary for a further six months okay. he was earning a lot more than i was so i was like okay well i'll go full time we'll split your salary um and i was still working weekends and nights with him um and then after six months we got traction ish he decided to leave as well and then we were both full time on it it was a, a year and a half later we got our first round of investment um it was a lot slower so you know 10 years ago the angel investing scene especially in london uk wasn't as obvious and big as it is now you know we we didn't even think about angel investing to be honest um so it took us a year and a half got our first round of funding the second year we got our second round of funding from the same angels so we only ever raised half a million so 250 and then 250 um in that fourth year was when we started the software and then we sold the company three years later uh and then had a two-year earn out with our new acquirers so the whole journey was about 10 years from start from going live to walking out the door for the last time so a long a long journey yeah and just picking up on the like how exciting it was and what you just said there at the end did you always have that exit in mind? Was that was that the thing that was exciting for you, like exiting and sort of making making it and making the money, or was it just the excitement of creating something new? At the start, it was definitely the excitement of creating something new, with the obvious stress of well, we need to be able to support ourselves. Um, Andrew had a wife at the time. Um, I had a mortgage, um, so there was that obvious stress which sort of dampens the excitement, but there's, you know, we, we have to make money somehow if this is going to work. But the, yeah, it was just the excitement of running our own thing, um, being creative, throwing around ideas, speaking to clients, you know, that was very exciting in the early days. Um, as soon as we got funding, we were very clear on what we wanted to do with Design My Night, and that was to exit within five years of funding. Um, we knew there'd be an earnout period after that as well. So for us, you know, you'll hear a lot of founders now saying, I want to stay in my business forever. I want to change the world. You know, let's be blunt. Our, you know, we were putting people in bars. We weren't changing the world. We, we were changing hospitality for the good. You know, we thousands of um, restaurants and bars love our software luckily but you know we weren't changing the world and for us it was never about making it but what we both did want was to become financially free we were like if we're in our mid-30s and we've had a wild ride and we are then financially free um, which means very different things to very different people um luckily andrew and i's vision of financially free was aligned um then we were like okay yeah let's try and get to that and sell it you know we don't want to run this business for another 20 years um and 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 part of that reason was why we didn't go abroad you know we could have gone to america we could have gone to europe 
but that would have added another five to 10 years. And yes, maybe a much bigger exit, but it's just not what we wanted to do. We wanted to then move on. You know, we were exhausted. And after 10 years of it, we were like, okay, now it's time to just do something new in your life. Yeah. Does it have uh, interest with the entrepreneurs that you work with? Do you feel like they think enough about those kind of sort of practical like how much money I want to make, when, when do I want to become financially free? Why am I actually doing this in the first place? Do you think no. that kind of thing is thought about and spoken about enough? No, we're near enough. And it's one of the first things I will always bring up in like our, our, our uh, once I've invested, you know, one of our early chats, because it's quite, it can be quite a personal conversation um and it's like look i've invested now you don't have to give me the spin that you want to build a an ipo or a unicorn or whatever um you know what do you want because because as an investor and as an early stage investor i'm here to help you reach those goals um and if that is exit in five years for 50 million quid or if that is stay for 20 years and go to ipo either way I'm, I'm happy with that. And we, and, and, and you will run the business very differently. Mm. That's the thing. What people don't think is yeah. for us to exit in five years, we, we changed our strategy completely to try and get to that valuation within five years versus IPOing or whatever. Um, yeah. So it's yeah. something that is not thought about enough and it's something I will yeah. always bring up. Yeah. I find that really interesting. I just think it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's very difficult to sort of make, it's almost like the roots are kind of your personal life and, and where you want to go. And then the sort of the trunk and the, the tree is the business, but yeah. you're not, if you're not looking at those roots, it's difficult to, to know what the right decision is. Like it's yeah. And, and, and a lot of people will separate that. Um, and they'll just think, well, I'm just going to keep going and it's going yeah. to be a success. But, you know, again, success is so different to different people. Um, so yeah. me, unless you quantify what success is, um, which doesn't have to be monetary um, for, for Andrew and I being not being mega rich, but being financially free was important to us. And we're not ashamed of saying money was a big driver um, because now we've, we're living a life that we wanted to lead because of those 10 years that we put into Design My Night. Yeah. Allowed you that freedom to then do what you wanted to do with your what time. What you right? want. Basically. Yeah. 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 No, that that's that's sort of the whole the whole point of unboxing. Really, it's about trying to not free yourself so you don't have to do anything ever again, but more just free yourself enough so that you don't have to do things that you don't want to do as much. Yeah. Because I feel like we are through school and uni, we're kind of given that conditioning of of we have to do certain things, like you ha- you should get a job and you have to do these things, and sort of it's a it's a slow process on the practical level of becoming sort of financially free enough. So you don't have to do it, but also emotionally actually just allowing yourself to constantly do things you want to do rather than things you sort of have to and feel like you should do. Yeah. I think our our sort of like, you know, I'm mid thirties. So I think our like parents generation was very much, and I'm lucky I I didn't grow up in that, but it's very much, you, you go to a company, you work there for 20, 30 years, you get your pension, you have two kids you go on your one 1.5 holidays a year and and that and that's great and and that is still great for some people I'm not saying that is not what you should do but yeah I think there is a big shift now and I think the startup world is a big part of that you know you don't necessarily have to start a startup but a very viable option for a career is joining startups now and being there early in the journey and taking equity and that equity could become worth a lot in 10, 20, 30 years. Um, so that's, again, what I say to a lot of people is if you love the startup world, you don't have to be a founder and you don't have to have that idea. But there's super viable careers now um, across the board in startups. So that, you know, instead of going to L'Oreal, go and join a startup. Absolutely. Absolutely. I just wanted to jump back very quickly on you sort of said how, you know, stressful at the start with the sort of financial situation and the revenue situation. So my first question was around what was the sort of revenue situation with Design My Night? Was it, uh, you mentioned that it was a startup where you were just going to grow the website big and then sort of monetize it later. 
um, with what I can imagine would be a bit, a bit, a bit, a bit of a hockey stick uh, yeah. forecast. Um, and then sort of the second part of that question is, we see a lot of these startups now, um, you know, even very famous startups, which aren't profitable yet. And they're sort of constantly raising and raising and raising money. So what from your take is the situation as sort of your average tech startup founder? Should you look to be profitable as soon as you can and then scale? Or is that not necessarily the way you have to go? So from a DMN point of view, design my night point of view, we um, we always had it in our mind that, that we wanted to run a profitable company, um, not only f- for security of the team and ourselves, but also we didn't want to give away too much equity. So again, that's a lot of founders don't sit and plan out what, what their equity journey would be. You know, if you need to keep raising money as a founder, especially if you're a co-founder or there's three of you, you can end up with like one percent of your own company. So Andrew and I knew that we wanted to get to profitability as soon as possible more than happy to take a hit on salary and and all of the good stuff early doors even the whole journey and keep pumping that money back into the company which would save us equity i.e not having to raise again um and then when we sold that would be our payday um you know when we sold i think we were like the 10th best paid at design my night still so you know we weren't paying ourselves stupid salaries still um so for us it yeah it was it was a slow burn so again we were a bit more of a dinosaur than a lot of startups this uh, nowadays um we got traction but small you know small 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 traction like you know a thousand a month two thousand a month and that was just in like ad revenue sales right um it wasn't i think i think when we raised our first round we were probably doing like five grand a month or something yeah and that was in ad sales ad sales ad sales to venues so like bars wanting to list on our site got it okay because i because i know design my night mostly as a as a booking platform right yeah so did that come a bit later so the booking stuff came um after so luckily we had lunch with the founder of top table which became open table um so they were sort of the pioneers of booking into restaurants and became a big competitor eventually. Um, and he was talking to us about the booking model, et cetera, et cetera. So we were like, okay, we should do this for bars. So our, literally like the next week, we just put a make a booking button on all of our listing sites, didn't speak to any of the bars. And then the booking just came into Andrew and I, and we would manually book people into bars. Um, and then we started building up that business, which was super manual and was us doing it. Um, but then we would take, uh, you know, uh, a pound for every person we put into your bar. Um, so we did that for a year. And then we took it the next stage by building the actual booking software. The beauty of being a soft pivoting to a software company was you then charge people a monthly direct debit to use your software. Yeah. It's not yeah. based yeah. on your own traffic or how many people you're putting in their venue it is here is a software that you're going to use and pay us monthly for it um so our revenue really started to tick up um probably um sort of five six months after the second investment where we started really signing up bars Um, and within a year we probably had most of the top bars in the UK using our booking system. Um, and that was just monthly revenue coming into the business. And we would just hire very carefully and, you know, only hire people that we needed. We hired very junior at Design My Night. So we weren't paying 70 grand salaries. We were paying like mid 20 salaries. For a lot of people, it was their first job. Um, so, you know, we really had a culture of hiring young, hungry, people with just great personalities that just would fit into the culture of design my night. And then Andrew and I worked very hard molding their careers and, and teaching them account, account management or customer success or whatever, uh, or marketing. Um, and, and, and that was one of the things we're most proud of, you know, and most people stayed at design my night and all those people that we hired as juniors, when we left, we're running teams of 15, 20, and they've been there the whole time, starting on mid-20s. So not only are you saving a ton of cash, 
but you're also not hiring attitude. We were hiring people that were hungry. They didn't need a 60 grand salary at the start and they loved Design My Night. That was their career. Um, so you have a group of people that have grown up within the company. They've also grown up in the mold of your company as well. They don't come with attitude. They don't come with preconceptions. Um, and it, yeah, it was just like a big family by the end. And so that was a, a huge way we saved a lot of cash. We didn't hire senior attitude people. That was never important to us. Um, so that's sort of how we did it. We got profitable pretty quickly. So the beauty of software. Um, and, and we were able to scale that out very quickly. And then we built a ticket software and we built a vouchering software, which we could then upsell to our current customers. So then we were doubling, tripling the revenue of each of our customers every month. And then it just starts to take care of itself. Um, in terms of other founders, it this whole nonprofit thing really annoys me. Um, I mean, I'm not a VC and I am not in charge of a unicorn, nor have I yet invested in a unicorn. So, you know, I, I, I'm also very aware that it is a different world and who am I to tell them that that's wrong? Um, but it does feel to me like the whole ecosystem of, of WeWorks and Ubers and what, while definitely revolutionizing the world and you do have to spend a lot of money to do that and Uber have definitely done that. Um, it feels like an ecosystem that just fuels itself. So we don't care about profit, but we're going to invest early. You're just going to spend this money to grow revenue, spend whatever you need. And then we're going to help you raise another round, which will, you know, triple our valuation. And then we're going to go again and we're going to triple our value. So everyone's just winning. You know, the founders win, the investors are all winning. And it's not till you hit IPO that then the markets are like, whoa, actually, this isn't a business. Um, so, I mean, huge, huge kudos to, you know, these startups that have just gone from zero to billions. You know, that that takes some going. You know, let me just say that it's not just spending money, but it's never something that's been attractive to me, um, which is why, you know, you look at Amazon and love them or hate them. You know, he has built a sensational world beating world changing but also disgustingly profitable business <laughs> yes he needs to pay a lot more tax um but you know it is a business um and just spending money and raising money and spending money isn't a business in my mind um yeah. you know there, there has to be a point where the wheels fall off um and that that kind of it's a good point. And that leads me on to the, the question I was going to ask you, which was around, you know, what, what actually is success? We'll start off with for you now for startups and investing in startups or someone running a startup. What, what actually is a good definition of success, I guess, beyond it being profitable and sustainable in its own right? Well, you know, I I love to see it like a great culture and, um, you know, I want to help the companies I invest in foster a brilliant culture. And as I said, you know, fuel the next generation, you know, you talk about the PayPal mafia and all these businesses that all the ex PayPal people have gone to set up. We've, we DMN, I'm not saying they're the PayPal mafia, but we've had a few that have gone on to start their own startups now. Um, and we're sort of helping them from the sides. Um, so I think fostering that, the fueling the startup community um, and the ecosystem, which is super important for the UK government, but also as a new channel for people that you don't have to go into the corporate world. I think that's, that's success. Um, but it's also just what does the founder want? You know, it has to come down to money at one point. I'd be lying if, it, you know, I'm an investor um, and I'm investing my own personal money into your business. And I'm not just doing that as a hobby. Um, so I want to see returns. So we would discuss that with the founders, you know, for you, what is success? So it has to be an exit at some point or an IPO. Um you know, that is ultimately where success will get you to. But there's very different levels of that from selling to 10 million to IPOing for billions. You know, that's quite a big yeah. range. Yeah. And you sort of mentioned that, you know, changing like design my night, 
wasn't necessarily changing the world as you as you said like just putting people in bars is that something that you think businesses need to be caring about more sort of thinking about more obviously it depends on what the business is but obviously it's a big topic but yeah i was wondering what your take was on that kind of the purpose side of business startups and investing as well yeah i think purpose has become a much bigger thing which is great because i think startups are the ones that will change the environment yeah. and will yeah. change inclusion and diversity and will change um male versus female in the boardroom that type of thing um so you know all of the injustices and bad things that government do um and big business do i think startups are the only ones that can change the status quo um you know when uh, Elon Musk, we, I think, wheeled a rocket to uh, some national rocket institution or whatever way back when they all just laughed at him. Um, and, you know, look what he's done now. And obviously he's a very extreme example. Um, so I think it's super important for startups to do that, but also I'm not going to sit here and preach and be like, well, a good startup has to have good impact. Um, not all businesses, not all startups have to be changing the world for the good, not the bad, but you know, you don't have to make a positive impact. And as long as the, the company you're building is having an internal positive impact. So the way you hire, the way you promote, the way you encourage your team, the way you grow your team, that's enough for me. Um, so I don't want this cutthroat founder that will do anything he or she needs to do to win. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the business itself doesn't have to be changing the world. Yeah. Very nice. Now, it's really good to, to hear some of your thoughts there around, uh, around startups. Um, Nick, I did, I did also want to chat to you. I, I actually came across you, I believe, initially on LinkedIn when I just saw a few posts around your, you're talking a little bit about, I think it was around sort of authenticity and just the one that really resonated with me, which was just like, there's certain things I think you think you have to do as a startup founder to sort of be an entrepreneur or to like be a startup founder. And if you don't do those things, then you're sort of not worthy. Um, so that was something that that resonated with me. And and then I also saw a post about your journey around gay shame as well. Um, so it'd just be, it'd be really interesting to hear your story around that process that you kind of went through and maybe get some some thoughts on you know how that's changing over time as well yeah i think from a, a founder point of view um as i said before i think it's becoming a bit celebritized being a founder um you know you it's it's i think a lot of people and will read tech crunch articles and you know people saying they made it on linkedin or tiktok or whatever without um, sort of realizing what goes on behind the scenes to, to get to that level of success. Um, and that for a lot of the time, you were seeing the same people being the successful founders. So white, male, middle class, probably, you know, mum and dad probably funded the first iteration of the product. Um, and, and I suppose you know, when that is shoved in your face constantly, um, you th if you don't fit into that mould, you probably think, oh, well, can, can I be successful if you don't actually see that being successful? Um, so, yeah, I, I sort of rally against the whole, you know, the, as I say, the, the almost like the, the fetishization of being a founder, that it's sexy and it's cool and it's fun and you can do whatever you want. Um, like it is tough. It's like the toughest thing I've ever, ever done from a, a personal point of view, from a stress point of view, from worrying about clients to worrying about money to, you know, uh, not seeing your friends and family and loved ones. Like it's all consuming. Um, and there's lots of trends about, you know, what health and well-being and, you know, you don't have to be that type of founder. You can close your laptop at five and go and meditate and go for a run and then eat quinoa. Um, but like that's just, not, you know, I personally think that's not reality. I've never seen 
and I get slammed on LinkedIn at sometimes sorry I've never seen a successful founder not work their arse off um and I say to all these comments okay that's all well and good but show me someone that has been super successful and at least for the first two three years haven't worked their arse off to get it where it is um, and I'm not saying you shouldn't look after your own well-being. Of course you should. Um, and that's extremely important. I think a lot of that, you know, meditation or exercise or yoga, healthy eating is super important. But as long as you understand that you are going to actually work yourself to the bone in the, the first early years to get it started, because that's just what it takes. Um, so, yeah, that's sort of what I feel on that side, sort of rally against the the easy aspect of being a founder um from my own own personal journey i think the post you saw on linkedin um, about gay shame was again me not seeing any sort of gay representation in the uh, in the startup world um and then as an investor now too which is even more white middle upper class old um so I just didn't see any representation of that. And I never, so I never hid anything from my team. So my team knew we were very obviously accepting open team. Uh, all my team knew I was gay. That was, you know, I never would hide anything from my team. But what I did do was sort of closed myself off a bit from clients. Um, you know, naturally, if you're out with clients or whatever, you, you know, you ask about, personal life and all of that and I would again I would never lie or anything but I would just sort of close off that side of me and al almost kept it business only which I think hindered me from 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 creating you know really good relations close relationships with some of the clients um and I called it gay shame because as a gay person um you know, the age I am now, mid thirties, I'm very fortunate that we're in a much better place than, you know, than people that have really fought for, for gay rights. Um, but yeah, I still, I still felt that other people would judge me in a negative way, but that was me projecting my own shame on other people um rather than them making any inkling that they would have a problem with it um and yeah as a gay person you 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 grow up with religious people telling you you're sinful with um being called you know whatever words under the sun you know i i live in london and so even some friends can't you know when i say oh i can't even hold my boyfriend's hand in london because someone will shout in the street and they're like no that's ridiculous you're in london i'm like no even in london um and then you had you know the rights where uh, that thatcher brought in that you couldn't teach it in school um and still to this day you know the all the religious people are like well you know you shouldn't be teaching kids about same-sex marriage and and same-sex marriage is only just so it's just a constant barrage basically of being told what you are is wrong and I think a lot of gay people have this inbuilt shame which is why I think a lot of people hide it or take longer to come out because you are obviously worried what people are going to think um and that sort of held me back a lot um from developing closer personal relationships with people and I, I, I wish I hadn't done that um and and you know just to educate other people it's just being aware so if you meet someone you know, a lot of people say to me, do you have a girlfriend? Uh, that would be their first question. And that would immediately put you on the back foot. Because uh, then you just think, oh, oh, what are they going to say if I say boyfriend? Um, so I think other people need to be educated and just be aware. And we're having a, a moment with gender as well at the moment. Um, so, you know, I don't think people will berate you for saying anything wrong, but just being self-aware when you speak to people that they might not fit into the box of society that you put yourself into. Yeah. Really well said. And I think, uh, yeah, it's, it's just something as simple or you think as sort of for someone who hasn't been in the shoes of, of sort of having that question, it's just something that you don't even think about like yeah. with most people. Um, 
I thought it was really well said also on the about it was you projecting your shame, which, uh-huh. you know, I think there's lots of things going on in society where, uh, you know, a similar kind of thing is happening where there's a general consensus in, amongst society. And if you don't fit into those boxes of society, it's very difficult for you. But I think you also see a lot of people only playing the victim role mm-hmm. in those positions um so to take some responsibility on themselves as well to sort of try and change the problem i think is a is a massive step but but sort of caveated with the fact as you pointed out after in that it isn't just in your own head like these things are real and people yeah. are judging <laughs> like so yeah, like, you know it's, as, as a gay person you don't know if someone is religious for example and i don't want to keep picking on religious people but you know, you, you're, you never know who you're going to meet, basically. And, you, you know, you might meet someone who seems very liberal and friendly, and, but they're raised in a religious household. And, and you know, they just think what you're doing is, is sinful. And I think look, all of us, as pe- very few people can just dust people off and dust what people think off about you you know if you can do that you're a very lucky person at the end of the day us humans we all want to be liked we all want to fit in we all want to have friends that love us and we love them um so the minute you think people are going to judge you based on your own lifestyle choices can make you feel more nervous to, to to just open up and be you know i've never been happier since i came out um so um you know that that was a a great life decision for me and i wish i did it way earlier um but i did hold it back in business and 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 putting it on linkedin was sort of my first time as a founder talking about it which a lot of my customers at dmn and i've exited then but would have seen that and been like oh nick's gay i had no idea and it wouldn't have been a problem, but I had no idea. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I, I sort of want to now instill that and be a hopefully, you know, um, a, an example for, for other people in at least my community that you don't, you know, you can be, as, obviously, it sounds silly when you say it, but you can be a very successful gay founder and build a big business um, and sort of, be a beacon for that and I want to mentor you know LGBT plus people who are founders and help them build their startup as well Um, I've actually invested in a company called Calder which is um, a mental health well-being app for the LGBT plus community so I really wanted to put my money where my mouth was and actually help and invest in products that help that community too Um, so yeah, that's something I want to do a lot more of now. Amazing. And if you were sort of giving advice to someone who was maybe the five or 10 year younger version of yourself in that position, is it just as simple as just tell the truth and just be yourself straight away? Or are there sort is it sort of a process where that you have to go through to actually be then ready to be your full self? Or were there any good tips that you sort of did to get to that stage where you're ready i mean that makes sense yeah it makes sense and it's it's really tough to um to tell people how and what they should do you know everyone has a very different journey and you know i can say oh i wish i did it earlier and i um, and hey guess what none of my friends care my parents didn't care um and i should should have just done it earlier but i think everyone has their own different journey and you have to fully accept it yourself first um before you feel comfortable enough to expose yourself because it's very exposing um you know if you if, if you meet a straight person you don't be like oh when did you come out as straight when did you feel comfortable enough in yourself that you could tell people that you had a girlfriend and, you know, suddenly people are asking very personal questions as well that you wouldn't ask a straight person. So it's very exposing. Um, So I think you have to just be very comfortable within yourself. And, you know, I just, well, I 
just want to tell people that it's definitely not wrong and you can be a huge success um, and there's a great community, you know, whatever your personal circumstance, whether it be family or whatever. Um, and I personally have never felt better since I became comfortable with who I was and could be authentically myself. Amazing. Thanks very much for, for sharing. And it's, um, yeah, been really great to, to hear your thoughts on, on your journey, um, across, you know, investing, running a business and also your more personal journey. So I really appreciate that. I want to jump into the final round. And my question is if there's one thing that you'd like to change in the next five years specifically, um, what would it be? About me or about anything, the world? Anything like main more it's about the world, I would say, rather than you. Um, Just something that we'd like look back on and be like, oh, five years ago, like you wouldn't have believed that it'd be like this or something. You're, you're literally asking me to be Steve Jobs in a minute. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um i'm not on his level unfortunately uh one thing that i would like to change in five years well i i think this will happen is i don't think we'll eat meat okay and i i eat meat yeah um, really you yeah. reckon it will completely go maybe 10 years okay. i think we'll have we'll be fully i think we'll we'll have autonomous uber and car car ownership will disappear in five years so there will just be all these autonomous vehicles going around the road at a standard speed and you'll be able to get one every minute so there'll be and it will cost nothing because they won't have drivers so there'll be no point owning a car i think that's more of a reality and i think in 10 years people will look back and be like oh my god you killed a cow and ate its ass cheek <laughs> <laughs> love it <laughs> Great stuff. I'm not even gonna. I'm not even gonna delve into that. I like. I like the bold yeah. predictions. And yeah, if both happen, I'll probably miss meat a bit, but I'll probably just get on with it. I think the reason I eat meat mainly is because it's just there on the shelf, presenting itself for me to eat. So and they're growing it in labs. And after I had a, I think an honest burger, which was a Beyond Meat burger. Yeah. And for me, like. And let's be honest, but in a burger, you can't really taste the meat that much. But it's the texture of eating a burger and they nail the texture. And I ate this burger and I was like, this could be a beef burger, 100%. Yeah. Um, and it was when I had that, which was a few years ago, I was like, wow, OK, that is that is next level. So, so I think when someone can do that for like a steak. Yeah. Um, yeah, then I if think can, if they can grow a steak that tastes as good as a real one in a lab, then I'm all for that. I'm all for it. I think they will. Great stuff. And then, so this is back into the the main podcast. I'll just use this bit to to round off the show. Um, everyone who comes in the unboxing ring, it has a track that can, rather than in boxing, where you have a track to pump you up to play into the ring. After you've you know dropped all your bombshells in the podcast, you get a track to play you out as you walk out. So, what would yours be and why? Um, my, my track would be Destiny's Child Survivor because uh, I think that's an important message. Like, just keep fighting. Um, anything that comes your way, you can get through it. You just got to keep fighting, throw yourself through it, and you will come out the other end and destiny's child are awesome best Great girl stuff. Um, brilliant correct. stuff i will make sure that that track is cute <laughs> as you step over the ropes and and make your way out nick thank you very much for your time it's honestly been um real pleasure to have you in the ring um i'm i'm sure that there's going to be a lot of people getting a lot of value from that and um yeah hopefully stay in touch for the future thank you so much harry really enjoyed it <laughs>